good afternoon everybody welcome to all of you i am shubhra batra and uh, i am part of the wash team at intelecap and i'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to day 3 of sankalp global summit this is our second wash session of the day the first one uh, which is almost wrapping up now is uh, about how sgs can scale up uh, to become micro enterprises and what kind of challenges they face in doing so and what kind of support the ecosystem can extend uh, in being able to do so uh, and i think it's it's a very timely conversation uh, now that we think that the you know, next private sector could actually come from there uh given today we've gathered here for this particular round table discussion to talk about the financing opportunity as such in peak stage and septic management and deliberate on market mechanisms that can be put in place for enabling access to finance for private players currently operating fstp projects let me quickly go over the structure of today's uh, round table discussion tanya could you move to the next slide tanya okay so uh what we're going to do is we're going to quickly uh, the intelicap team uh, between me and vinith we will quickly set a bit of context i will introduce uh, all our uh, round table participants and then we will move on to a couple of presentation by existing private sector players who are uh, operating fstp projects across the countries right uh, country right now post which uh, we would like to have a moderated discussion uh, with Uh, all of our esteemed uh, speakers including financial institutions uh, funders entrepreneurs as well as our other ecosystem enablers who joined us today uh let me also take this opportunity to introduce our moderator and other round table participants our moderator for the day is mr manoj gulati managing director water.org india as managing director manoj champions water.org india's strategy and operations and is responsible for scaling credit financing for wash as a financial product under his leadership water.org has been able to provide technical assistance to various financial institutions enabling them to scale wash as a separate lending category this has resulted in over 3 million wash loans being successfully offered mobilizing over rupees 4000 crores for this upcoming sector we have tried to bring together all relevant stakeholders including financial institutions funders entrepreneurs and other ecosystem enablers to the table today so as to have an enriching and engaging discussion on this very critical topic may i please request all our round table participants to switch on their cameras as i do a quick round of introductions from financing institutions we have with us today dr s s acharya general manager sidbi shri arupananda jena general manager yuko bank and sbc convener of state of odisha mr nikesh sinha ceo of ashwa Mr. Royston Braganza, CEO of Grameen Capital; Mr. Sridhar Sampath, Regional Head at Water Equity; Mr. Hemant Paleda and Mr. Rajkumar Chand from Impact Investment Group of Indusind Bank; Ms. Meena Jaising, Head of Partnerships at Swakarma; and Mr. Sai Pramod, Investment Manager at Caspian. We are also joined by Ms. Namita Banka, Founder and CMD of Banka Biolu, and Mr. Sampath Kumar, Managing Director of Thai Technocrats. Both these organizations are currently operating FSTP projects across multiple states in the country. We also have with us today Ms. Sakshi Gudwani, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, along with Mr. R. K. Srinivasan and Mr. Apoor Shukla from USAID. Both these organizations have been playing a pivotal role in catalyzing private sector participation in the FSSM space. Last but not the least, we are also joined by representatives from some very key ecosystem enabling entities in this space. Ms Meera Mehta Professor Emeritus at SEPT University Ms Natasha Patel Senior Advisor and Steering Committee Member at the India Sanitation Coalition and Professor Srinivas Chari Director of the Administrative State College Staff College of India my apologies and now i would like to call upon Mr Vineet Menon Associate Director and the Wash Lead at Intelicap to set the stage for this discussion Vineet let me just Thanks, put up sir. your presentation yeah. as well yeah thanks bro thank you yeah 
thank you everyone uh, thank you for agreeing to be part of this uh, round table i am vineet menon i lead the watch practice at intellicap uh, i i know i'm uh, uh, probably talking to people who already know this who, uh, but but i thought it's good to start with the current state of sanitation in india and what impact it makes uh, so that everyone on the floor are aware about the issue uh while everyone knows that uh, we have almost achieved 100% odf uh, october 2019 uh the impact of inadequate sanitation is also felt realized people know the uh, cost burden of uh, inadequate sanitation it's it's close to 2.44 trillion uh, uh, rupees uh, when it comes to economic impact of this the government also understands this and the best would have been uh, creating sewer solutions but uh, in terms of cost and time of implementation it wouldn't have been uh, easily possible and we wouldn't be able to achieve the required state uh, by 2030 the interim solution definitely fssm but the solution itself is adequate enough capable enough to be mainstream solution and primarily targeting the peri urban and the rural areas, uh, FSM, FSTP solutions are the ideal way to uh, go forward. Sunny, can you move to the second slide, please? Next slide. Uh, quickly onto the opportunity, I did. Uh, we we did share some pre-reads with with uh, the key members. Uh, the opportunity is quite huge. What we are looking at is close to 45 million septic tanks in by 2024. And this, what it translates into is around 3,500 million US dollars in the next five years. Uh, largely uh, onto the treatment, but uh, conveyance also has uh, a similar uh, investment requirement in the future. Next slide, please. While everyone knows about the opportunity, everyone everyone knows what the, uh, why uh, effective sanitation solutions are needed. Uh, let's not always expect the government to take up the mantle and uh, do it on their own. We definitely need private sector if we are even uh, trying to achieve the 2030 SDG goals. Now, why private sector is needed? Def uh, it's a specialized area. It's an area in which ULB staff is not uh, ULB staff is not equipped to handle. So first, reducing the burden on ULB staff, and also uh, this gives us an opportunity to bring in the technical expertise which the private sector brings in. The service efficiency and the implementation efficiency is undoubtedly uh, much better uh, when we uh, when we leverage private sector and their experience. Next slide, please. Yeah. And what we have been doing is uh, we have been talking to the private sector uh, on, on FSSM and we have been conducting various workshops. We have been taking feedback from different players, both uh, who are existing to FSSM and who are also uh, not part of FSSM, part of allied sectors like solid waste management and also uh, even, even construction companies who are willing to look at this sector. What we see is definitely there has been interest there has been interest in uh, looking at the opportunity and looking at uh, the, the potential which this uh, sector offers. Uh, we have heard feedback from private sector players that yes, we want to work in this sector, but we want, a, uh, we want an ecosystem in which we can thrive. We want a support mechanism which, which in which uh, we would be more comfortable with. These are some of the statements which different players have made uh, across the country and a uh, few things which have uh, come up uh, very significantly is the financing challenges which they feel, which they face while uh, while looking at uh, FSSM and sanitation as a sector next slide when we look at FSSM there are various models available but uh, to to uh, have a focused discussion we thought we will look at the construction of FSTPs and the ONM operation and maintenance of the FSTPs as two areas, uh, particularly for, for this workshop. 
and there are various uh, business models various project structures within within these two options uh, there is a ppp contract we have epc solutions we have turnkey contracts as well and similarly in onm we have an additional only services contract also next slide please so uh, just with the context with the pre read material which you had what we intend to do during this session is one showcase and talk about the fssm financing opportunity understand the fi's financial institutions point of view on the feasibility of financing uh, private sector in this in this particular sector and also if at all we need to develop a market building mechanism what should be what 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 should be the key building components what are the key criteria which we need to think of when we want to develop a successful uh, market mechanism so these are the three core objectives manoj feel free to add uh, uh, any to this but uh, yeah that setting the context and uh, shubhra do i need to hand it over to you or manoj uh, a bit for uh, right now to me i'd just like to invite uh, namita from banka balu to take us through uh, her experiences of uh, running fstp projects in uh, andhra pradesh and telangana just a second please Namita, is that okay? Fine. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, to introduce myself, I'm Namita Banka. I am heading Banka Bayalu as a managing director, and of course, I'm also the founder of the company. Uh, so uh, we have been, uh, of course, talking a lot about uh, water sanitation and hygiene, and we are one of the uh, private partners. And I believe private-owned uh, entities are uh, there to, uh, with, with they have a separate, different kind of an experience. And I'm here to share my experience with you on a decentralized uh, fecal waste treatment system, which we have developed called Pluto, the geotip technology. Next, please. So first, uh, we have to understand what is the process involved in in uh, of uh, FSTP or FSM management. It it cannot be similar to the STP, but definitely it has a very very distinctive quality of the sludge that is coming in. So the three stages that we define very distinctively is the first is the process where these sludges come in and the holding tank or the equalization tank or the homogenization process because they are all coming in the batches. then the second uh, stage is very very critical which is the solid and the liquid separation uh, because the waste that is coming in here is uh, stored in a containment for very very long time and so the solid contents uh, may vary from as low as 2% to as high as 8% to 12% that we have seen across our uh, our two plants that are running from last two years so that's a very very critical uh, concept here that we need to really work on how we are going to uh, do this uh, particular separation and third finally there are two by products that come out of this whole uh, fsm uh, treatment uh, plants or the process is the solids that is uh, separated and dried and of course they have to be treated and the second the raw water which comes out again that has to be treated separately and of course the disposal so they all have to come under under cpbc norms which are still not very robust it is still coming out but i think so the policy is there so it will now happen so next so basically i will explain uh, what what it means to us and why why we are in this business so for me it's very simple that it is it is it's a simple that the waste which is coming out from the toilet needs to be treated 
uh, treated. If they're not done in an eco-friendly manner, they have to be done it otherwise. So, uh, so that's the reason million, millions of septic tanks have been built in last five years since under Swachh Bharat mission. And most of them have either a septic or a pit latrine or a septic tanks. So they have to be emptied as discussed by Vineet also. So there is a huge opportunity for us there. And, and we, we estimate it to be uh, $25 billion. And uh, the second part is then how are we going to do it? So either we do it on site, the treatment can be done on site or transport it to a centralized uh, fecal sewage treatment, a slash treatment plant. The model is very, very critical to the success of this FSM. And there are, uh, there are uh, for the CAPEX and the OPEX and both need to be there to make it a sustainable model. So CAPEX can be either PPP or a, a, a HAM model or other, which I'm gonna discuss in details. And technology, of course, it's still not very developed, but uh, 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 since there, there are two, three players who are demonstrating very strongly some very strong uh, technological interventions, which I feel that they can be scaled up in the next coming years. Next, please. So our business model uh, that I'm going to discuss today is that uh, HAM model and uh, and the epc of course there are three four models that's ham epc and government funding or a csr funding but we are we'll discuss mostly uh, about the ham model because we are working on that so ham model basically provide the government is providing us a 50% uh, in andhra pradesh and 60% uh, upfront in uh, in uh, telangana so and the land has been allotted by the ulb and the municipality it is their responsibility to, to give us the land a clear land with the geo and, uh, and the supply of the sludge is also the responsibility. They're supposed to streamline the, uh, the, the sludge desludgers and uh, they, they have to bring it to our site. And we, ha we have to just, our responsibility rise to take the sludge and treat it. So, and the funding, 50% funding has to be made by the concession or the private partners like us. Now here we have seen some very, very few challenges. We have seen some strong challenges, but uh, we have tried to overcome some of them. So since it's a very, very nascent and the HAM model, which, uh, which is referred mostly for the road projects, did not seem very, very interesting to the initial, to the funders. But we, since we bagged already one, uh, uh, we have convinced uh, one of the investors. So we don't think that's a very big challenge. Only thing is we need to show more uh, success stories. So that was uh, one of the uh, things in HAM model. The second ham model was that, of course, little government also was uh, not having a ready-made model kind of a thing. So in in last two years, we have seen that that was, was opened up a lot, and uh, they they are showing us interest in ham model. And EPC model, I feel very strongly that uh, it's just uh, like you do something and you just get away with it. So there's no reliability of the plants working for very long time. So that is where I feel that if uh, we also have a skin in the game, we will perform better as a private partner. Now there is a concept which we are working on, which is called the private FSTP, where we do not rely on the government funding. So like any industry, we take part, uh, we procure the land and we do the design construction and uh, own of the plant for a set period of time or till when, whenever we want. The challenge here, what, what we feel very thing is that procurement of the land is the biggest challenge. And, uh, uh, and of course the industry which we are dealing may not be very acceptable to many people. So that needs to be established and the government is focusing on it. So maybe later in this two, three years, it will come, come to that level that it will be recognized as an industry itself. Next. Next, please. Yeah. So we, we are the case study that I have presented here is the AP, AP in Telangana, where of course it's the total concession period is about for 10 years. Uh, five, uh, six months uh, uh, construction period and nine and a half month of annuity, where the total uh, capex is coming to about 3.5 million for these 21 plants that we are going to invest in, and uh, about uh, 8.4 million dollars for uh, the opex for the next 10 years. So, and the current uh, opex run rate is about 1500 dollars per month. So the capacity here, we have given individual of this, but total capacity for both the, uh, the projects that we have is about uh, 325 KLD. So we'll be treating 325 KLD per day in, in these 21 plants. So, and the operations, of course, are the existing ones started two years back and uh, the rest of them will be starting in the next year, 2000, 2021. 
So here we have calculated an internal rate of return, which is approximately coming to 27% right now, uh, but there has been little delays in last year. So there might be a little bit change in this, but we have already received a payment from a Rajam plant, which is uh, the CapEx has been received 100%, 50% uh, their contribution. Now we have put in the bid for uh, payment request for our uh, this, uh, four quarters of working and our annuity payments. So that is in the process. So we feel very confident that uh, we'll be getting our payments in Rajam and uh, AP. And uh, Telangana, we just inaugurated recently. So we are in the trial period. And uh, all the funding that initially we did was our through inter internal accounts. And uh, fortunately, we were able to convince what equity and uh, Shridhar was there. Uh, Shridhar is there here today. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Korean also here. So, so I, I think it was a very long time we convinced them and they got very convinced that yes, this should be a fundable project. And they funded us. Uh, we have drawn only 50% of the funding. They funded us for 1 million. We have only uh, withdrawn 50% uh, of that fund. And by end of this year, we will be drawing the others. So there are some challenges in this ham mall right now uh, based on the land. That's the major challenge that we are facing that uh, it has been given to us. But when we go for uh, construction, we are facing some local, local uh, issues and local community issues, which of course, all the government is trying to help us out and uh, get this. So we already have 10 lands in our kitty. 10 more is in process to be completed. So this is the uh, status right now with the Avanaha model. Next, please. Next, uh, Shubhra. Yeah. Is it okay now? So what we have realized, yes, just this is the last slide. Uh, so sure. what I have, we have understood in the last two years is that uh, we have uh, received a very varied kind of sludge types. So that was the biggest challenge that we had to achieve in our technology, that uh, sludge is coming as, uh, again, from 2% to 8 to 10%. So and that has to be one critical factor while selecting any, any technology. Then, of course, it has to be very, very cost effective in the terms of CapEx and the OpEx. Otherwise, we'll not be able to sustain. Maintenance uh, has to be minimal. And it is based because most of them will be based in rural in, in, in India. So we have to have a challenges of electricity, water, distribution. Local issues will be there. So we need to really see how we address to those issues and uh, and deployment, of course, in uh, rural areas, things change very fast. Like, you know, uh, we need to be very careful how we deploy them and how we are able to uh, employ the local people and to run these plants and uh, make them ownership. So most of my plants, I have made the owners, they become indirect owners of my plants, which they are running. So I don't need to keep going there again and again. So if that kind of a thing happens, I think the scalability will be much easier and returns will be much faster. And the largest and the most important is that it should be within the reach of the desludgers. So the land, uh, selecting a land becomes a very, very critical part of the whole FSM program. Otherwise, our desludgers will not come. So if they don't come, we don't, uh, we don't gain anything out of it. And uh, of course, eco-friendly it has to be. So this is my take on FSM as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a sector and as a private player, that these are the things we need to take in consideration before we plan any kind of uh, implementation in FSM. I think uh, this is from my side. So this is our honorable chief, uh, chair, this is KTR Garu, who inaugurated our first plant in Boingir on 2nd of October. It was well taken by all of them and they have speeded up a lot of processes. And I think so we'll be able to close all of them by Ma March 31st. Next, please. Thank you so much. And these yeah. are some- Thank you. Plans. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, not right. an issue. I'm, I'm over. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Namita. Uh, Sampaji, I'd like to invite you uh, to speak now. Just give me a minute, please.
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sampath. Uh, I come from this organization called Tight Technocrats Private Limited. We are a Bangalore-based company. Next slide, Shubha. Uh, we have been uh, setting up, uh, actually been involved with speaker-slash treatment plants for the last three and a half, four years. We have four functional plants at this point of time. Uh, and we are in the process of setting up uh, two more on the EPC model and uh, another uh, around 20 on the ham model uh, i am at this point of time in this particular presentation talking from the uh, epc perspective because sunamita has already talked about the ham perspective one thing which i would like to point out in this slide from very clearly for all the persons there is that we are now having namita and uh, tight technocrats banka team tight technocrats and two other players have caught together and uh, set up a sustainable uh, sanitation industry association. And it's our interest at this point of time to collect all these industries and go forward with, you know, with the, the people in the sanitation industry to like, take them forward to the next step. And one of the key requirements there is the financing. So we would really, we are very greatly interested in this particular uh, session because we are looking at this as an opportunity to influence people to think financing for sustainable sanitation, point one. And then if in any way we can participate in it, we have now got a fairly strong team of people who can put together and uh, on the other end, working with the industry, try to make a difference. The next slide. Super. Yeah, so I directly jump into what, uh, you know, technology-wise, uh, Namita had talked of, talk of one technology which they are doing. We do one other kind of technology. But I think at this point of time, as I see it around in the market, there are at least about four or five different people having done technologies. I think there are more than about... 70 to 100 systems already installed today in India. So this is not some new idea, new technology, new concept being put together. This is an idea which has, which has already found its place in India. So FSTPs as a concept is already in place. So there is, an, there is a uh, concept around which we can you know, end up growing. And there seems to be a demand. I'll come to the demand part next. So if this is the broad, in, the broad understanding in terms of the costs which we have been observing, so this is not my cost or uh, the cost of the, uh, you know, the one or two operators, but this is the typical kind of range of prices which we are observing, costs which we are observing. In terms of the capex, what I have generally observed is that the size which are there is anywhere between about 10 KLD, which is possibly a town of about 20 to 30,000 to about 100 KLD, which is a town of the, of the size of maybe about 10 to 3 lakhs of population. The, you know, the largest which I have seen is about 150 KLD plan, uh, uh, tender. So that would be the largest kind of a size which is there. But this is the kind of sizes which are there. And the kind of price points which we are talking of is basically anywhere between about, say, 6 lakhs per KLD to about 10 lakh per KLD. So as the size keeps coming down, the cost moves up to about 10 lakh per KLD as the capital cost. And as the size keeps increasing, it goes up to about five to six lakhs per KLD. So that's the kind of number. In terms of the OPEX, the OPEX does not seem to be as variable, but there seems to be an, you know, sort of a base price around 80,000 to a lakh of rupees per month. That's the kind of a base price everybody is talking of, whichever technology is concept you are taking it up to. It's then progressively increasing, but it is not dramatically increasing by size. What you would realize is that the you know the number of people added, maybe some extra chemical may come in or some extra power might come in, but it is not dramatically increasing. So there is some ratio which you could play around with. And that's the kind of pricing which is there. So this is what the kind of investment which is uh, investment and operations costs which are involved. So the next slide. Next slide, please. I'm, yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, an EPC project is basically a project where it's very similar to any other construction contract. It's a works contract. Any of the FSTP is a two-part. One, there's some civil works, there's some electromechanical works. So it's basically a works contract which is there. The previous one, please. Previous slide. This one? Any, any... Any uh, FSTP contract is basically a civil works contract plus an electromechanical works contract. 
so finally it's just like any other works contract which any particular contractor would do when it is an endm uh, you know when it's an e e epc or a turnkey contract or something like that the design would have been could have been done by you the design could have been done by somebody else and you have been given a design and a boq that that choice might exist depending upon the uh, place where the tender the way the tender has been formulated but some places the epc includes the engineering some places the epc does not include the engineering but there's the engineering component but somebody has already done a boq and given you a boq you basically adjust it to the site which has been given to you so in that context i have you know what has been the experience i have see, taken some three different contracts which i have seen in the last uh, one year and put it down as three different examples i am not referring these are genuine original contracts which have been which have come out over the last three years across india uh, one was a 12 kld plant another was a 40 kld plant another is a 150 kld plant the estimated cost for the 12 kd kld plant was about 2 crores uh, the 40 kld was 3.1 and the uh, 150 kld is about 9 crores there are three different kind of costs as an operator which as a person who is bidding for this i get it first cost which i get is i have to give a bid security and this is typically in the range of about uh, you know 1% half a percent to 1% so that's the number which you see there then there's a performance security if i get the contract then i'll have to give a performance security which is anywhere between 3% to 5% and then the payment terms typically any one of these projects get get completed in about 6 months i think an fstp is typically a 6 months uh, work setting up an fstp so there is typically i have observed this particular number between about payment in about four parts which is about 25% 35% 20% there might be some variation in some of the other locations then finally there is also a 10% retention money which we have observed across the uh, board saying that everybody is maintaining a retaining a 10% over the last 10 uh, for a one year period the you know any one of these as any other civil contract the expectation is the margin will be about 15% maybe if you are a more efficient operator maybe it can be about 20% less the tax component so maybe maybe 12 13% post tax might be your margin that is the kind of number which i have been observing there is the kind of number which would be there so 12 20 to 22% or 23% kind of a margin you can push if you are very efficient so this is the kind of broad number which is there this is the structure of the contract which is there so now what is it as an entrepreneur what am i looking for from the financing sector the next slide please okay the first and the foremost thing which happens is that you know the bid security if if i am bidding today whenever i bid i have realized that every time i bid in a tender i am seeing not less than about half a dozen different people participating in the tender so that means this is my chance of success is possibly at best about 10% or 15% so that means i left if i want to be doing projects three projects a year or five projects a year i should be bidding for 30 40 projects and the bid security amount itself is a significant component because if i am doing about half a percent or 1% and 50 projects so i am actually doing 50% of the project cost as my bid security amount so that's a significant component so if there's some way it can be funded or at least you know i can get an um, uh, or, you know a bg uh, limit or something like that that makes a lot of sense for me one the second thing is the performance security which is the other significant component of initial cost which has to be put into place there is nothing dramatic about all this as i pointed out this is like any other uh, person who is doing a works contract the the only difference which typically comes here in the in an fstp contract is that the fstp is as a technology is relatively new from the perspective of the government so the the engineer who is getting into this fstp has is doing it most probably for the first time or the second time so if if he is doing a road or a bridge he knows what it means and what are the risks but when he is doing an fstp for him we are also training him a bit so the consequences although it might be a six months contract and i should consequently keep getting my payments every month or a month and a half and my you know the turnover should be one month or something like that it doesn't become that so my payment window becomes about 3 months to 4 months so that means i need to be having something like almost 40 to 50% or 50 to 60% of my in uh, my project cost as the working capital requirement and which is something which is far higher than most of the other uh, contracts which i have observed basically in the other contract maybe even a 25% margin is good enough whereas in an fstp we might have to have about a 50 to 60% margin so this particular window has to be built in and some financing support has to happen in terms of the size of this opportunity what i am realizing at this point of time is that 
theoretically india is going to be having anywhere between maybe about 5 to 7000 fstps over the next 5 to 8 years mm -hmm. practically i see maybe about 2 to 2 and 1/2000 fstps might come in at this point of time there are 400 there is a list which has been maintained by the nfssm alliance there are about 400 odd fstps in that list which is under construction or at various stages of construction my own call is annually we will be talking of anywhere between 500 to 600 fstps from this year or the next year onwards this year has been a bit of a sad situation because of the covid but i think next year onwards things might again take off so basically if you are talking about 500 600 fstps per year we are talking of an investments not less than about 1200 to 1500 crores and that means if a large percentage of it is going to go in through the epc route and which is what seems to be the trend at this point of time then we would be requiring anywhere between about 500 to 750 crores of support debt investment support to the various uh, you know entrepreneurs who are the supporting people who are putting up the contractors or the entrepreneurs who are there i think this is i think the kind of money which we are looking at and so that is what is the kind of support which we have to have there should be mechanisms in which these people have to be supported and there have to be ways in which to reach out to the contractors and say that we are going to be supporting them i think that's the need at this point of time as i see it thank you from my side thank you sampad ji thanks a lot all right so i'd like now uh, like to hand over to uh, manoj for taking this discussion forward uh thank you shubhra uh, and uh, thank you vineet uh, for inviting to moderate this session um earlier this afternoon at uh, when i was trying to log in my computer decided not to support my idea of coming and moderating this session so i had to move to plan b and that is to use my cell phone uh, for logging in so apologize if i'm not being able to come in in a much better way the topic that we have for today the financing mechanisms for fstp is indeed a very interesting and uh, compelling topic for us to move into uh in 2014 when we started uh, the in real earnestness under the prime minister the idea of having every household having toilets and then over a span of 4 to 5 years they had completed 107 million toilets we did not realize that while we were doing the build and use uh, focus of toilets the maintain and treatment of the toilets is a very big issue that stays with us Uh, Vinita earlier pointed out that around 39 uh, million uh, households will be needing some kind of a treatment plant as a facility. What has also come about is, and this morning, uh, Honorable uh, Minister Hardeep Singh Ji was talking about that, uh, and he openly said it that the government themselves cannot uh, support all the FSTPs and FSSM work to be done. and the same urgent that the private sectors and the financial sector comes in and starts taking the ownership so this is also sbm2 also brings in a very interesting next step to our journey uh we know that in 2015 it came under uh, treatment uh, fecal cell treatment or rather entire sanit water and sanitation came under the priority sector lending and then over the years uh, the dfs sent out notes to various uh, slbcs and then recently there was the nabard announcement of uh, 800 crores over the next one year so there's been a lot of movement that has happened in the financial sector i'm glad that today we have had a chance to focus entirely on the fstps let's talk about it uh, and we'll spend the next 45 minutes on uh, understanding it from different perspectives so before i get down to the uh, the core of the people that I'll, we, i'm we are all here to listen from the financial in, uh, institutions uh i'd like to actually take a quick uh, one minute question uh, to both uh, namita and to uh, uh, shridhar ji that you talked about the what is the size and the need of the market uh, obviously you you very well said that the market is today 325 klm or you are planning to make uh, namita said about 325 klm versus what uh, um, uh, vinit said it is around 61 mld market in the next four years now given this what do you think are the challenges you think banks and uh, have and financial institutions have in giving in supporting this kind of program what have you learned in the process just a minute each on your, on what are your what are your perceived concerns that banks have? 
Shall I take first, Sampaji? Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, my basic uh, uh, the the challenge that we see is the acquisition of land. So the problem that we are facing is because they are all decentralized. Uh, they are small, small bit of lands, and they are in the local uh, in ULBs located. So most of them are facing uh, the issue of the land. I, I that's what I feel. And uh, because uh, they, despite owning the land, uh, they are not able to actually give it to us due to other local issues. So that is a major challenge for scaling up these projects will be a big thing in the next. I, I feel that's a very big challenge. My, exp my experience is that, you know, whenever we go to bankers, they understand what we are saying. I think that is one question which we have never faced. They understand, they understand the gravity of the thing. But I, the, the biggest concern has been that, that the kind of expectation in terms of collateral or in terms of the security they are expecting from people like us who are relatively smaller and the kind of, uh, you know, backing in terms of our, uh, either otherwise or the backing in terms of the balance sheet which we have to get in. Both of this, I think, needs to be reassessed very carefully from the banker side if they really want more number of people to be in this sector because it is going to be extremely decentralized. Small scale operators are going to come in. Otherwise, there are the expectation to get big guys in. I think they will not find it worthwhile to do such decentralized work. Fantastic. So I'm glad to hear that both this, you know, the land and the, the size, which makes it uh, not very attractive and making it forward. Uh, I want to take this, um, and before we get down to the financial institutions, uh, maybe a sense comes also from uh, two institutions that have played a very large role in promoting this institution, uh, BMGF and uh, USAID. Uh, both have been, uh, you know, have for the last few years been bringing in the that the need and the urgency to solve this, uh, the, then bringing, scaling up FSTPs. Uh, Maybe at this stage, I can ask uh, both uh, Shini and Aura Purva to come in and as well as Akshi to come in and give her thoughts on, you know, what do they expect as uh, uh, grantees uh, from this uh, system? Uh, Sakshi, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Manoj. I can okay, go. fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for... Um, for this session, actually, uh, this is all music to our ears, uh, given we're come, come at a point where we're getting the private sector, the financial institutions and all of us uh, on the same table. Um, I think for us, you know, we kind of came at the sector uh, back in 2015, 14, trying to see how we can try and support the entire ecosystem to get the policy movement uh, going in with the recognition that FSM is an issue that states and cities um, need to uh, focus on. And we've got a lot of good uh, policy and budget commitments from on public funding from many, many states. And like Sampath said, 400 FSTPs are in different stages of uh, construction. And I kind of uh, agree with his estimation of another 500 to 600 every year coming into this. Um, into the sector. The challenge, of course, uh, why we, while we looked at the government's focus, the policy front uh, and the budgets coming in, I think we've kind of been slow on how do we get the private sector engagement going. And with the, with the current crisis that the country faces on uh, just the way MSMEs have, uh, have looked at the last six to eight months of their business and the kind of uh, risk appetite, which has reduced over time. There is a role for all of the, uh, all of the ecosystem players again. And I think as a donor organization, we're a little bit open to see what's that role that we can play uh, as well. Um, so that the market kind of starts working on itself. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, there have been mechanisms that have been looked at, uh, that have uh, kind of been explored, but none of them have garnered scale. We've looked at the escrow account. Uh, we've looked at, uh, you know, some of this private 
PPP models with the scheduled desludging sanitation tax mechanisms. But the constant question on delayed payments from ULPs is what is the biggest risk to this uh, private sector participation. And I'm really hoping in some way uh, this group can also advise on what our role could be and, or what the role uh, uh, of the financial institutions should be. I'll pause there. Yep, delayed payments is a big issue. Uh, and uh, uh, Shini, your thoughts on it? Hi, Manoj, this is Apoor uh, from Apoor, USA. Right, yeah. Hi, um, so thanks a lot again, uh, IntelliCap team and uh, Manoj and everyone for putting this together. Like Sakshi mentioned, this is quite a timely uh, session to do. Uh, Srini, unfortunately, is unable to uh, access his microphone for some reason, and he's really the technical expert in the room. Um, but I'll talk about uh, some of the things that, you know, be uh, some of rather the tools that uh, USAID uses or like, you know, wants to use uh, for uh, increased private sector participation and, uh, uh, you know, investment flowing into the war space. So first is uh, the partial credit guarantees uh, that mm. we provide to uh, the lenders. Um, and, you know, some of the partners probably are there on this call, but, you know, uh, the market is by and large familiar with that. So I'll not go into the mechanism too much, but the idea really is to help uh, these uh, lenders and financial institutions familiarize themselves with uh, a new space, really help them wet their uh, feet in the water and uh, improve uh, some of the risk profile that they have in their portfolio. So some of the, uh, you know, uh, financing challenges that um, Banka Bayalu mentioned, some of the financial challenges that Sakshi also touched upon. So the idea is, can a partial credit guarantee uh, make it easier for uh, lenders to, you know, get into some uh, into an area where there's a high perceived risk, but might not be like a high risk in reality. Secondly, uh, want to talk about blended finance. Uh, this is something that we are quite interested in and are exploring. And, uh, you know, the idea that we want to explore is, you know, how we can be more catalytic with the use uh, of our grants, right? How our grants can actually uh, be used to unlock uh, more uh, private sector investment coming into it. So for example, uh, you know, uh, maybe, and again, like this is very like initial thoughts, uh, you know, in we've seen a lot of these pay for performance development impact bonds come into healthcare education, you know, but uh, CR, CSR is one pool of money that's not been able to uh, come into uh, these kind of instruments as outcome funding. So can say a USAID or a BMGF uh, come in and uh, play the role of that uh, interest uh, component where uh, you know the CSR Companies Act does not allow companies to pay for profit, and then coming in as outcome funder. So you know one could be that model or other blended finance models where we uh, you know come in with the uh, financial institutions where it could be a first loss um, or it could be a, a you know performance based interest or principal buy down. So those are the kind of things that we are very open to exploring. And you know, would love to see how this conversation goes forward, and really want to hear uh, how blended finance is being seen by the financial institutions as well as uh, the final beneficiaries. Thanks, Apurva, and thanks for uh, you know talking about uh, the incre incredibly important role of USAID and uh, BMJ played with respect to potentially bringing in uh, you know partial guarantee as well as the the concept of uh, bringing in uh, low cost uh, financing uh, through blending uh, mechanisms. Uh, I think outcome funders role is also a critical role. Um, I'm actually, you know, inclined to move to the financial institutions and uh, maybe the uh, Royston, you have been a long taking thread from what Apurva said, uh, been a strong proponent of doing it in multiple SDGs and uh, uh, it's something which I, Love to hear from you. What do you think for the, especially for FSTPs, is there a, an opportunity to build the solutions around FSTPs, some kind of alternative financing mechanisms? Thank you, Manoj. First, let me do a sound check. Is that okay? Can you hear me okay? You're sounding yes, right. perfectly fine. All right. Yeah. So, unfortunately, while your, your laptop gave away, and uh, so didn't stay to plan. That was not the only thing that hasn't stayed to plan today, right? I mean, our predictions and posters <laughs> in the US have been uh, 
So I'm wondering why a second time in a row, but the blue shirt is not to show any political affiliations, but it's more because it's on a wash bond that we want to talk about. But uh, the fact that Apurva and, uh, you know, talked about uh, blended finance and Sakshi talked about it as well. And uh, I think I just want to step back and say, what are we seeing here that we've done right before? Uh, do we need to reinvent wheels? Do we need to create a uh, new models? What we're seeing here, and especially based on what Sampath and Amita talked about, is a scale of opportunity that reminds me 10 years ago of microfinance. We were talking about you know, $2 billion, $3 billion, $5 billion of an opportunity. Uh, and today we are at $25 billion. What moved the needle from the two to $3 billion uh, opportunity to the 25 billion? Uh, while there are many views in the room and in a compact, uh, in a conference like Sankalp, you'll have many views. Um, I have a one word answer for that, and that is debt. The type of scale that happened was predominantly debt. So, uh, you know, Shubhran Vinit, uh, for, you know, putting this together with debt providers, I think is critical because I think uh, that's really what's going to move the needle dramatically. How do we bring debt into this transaction? And then again, uh, you know, Vineet's presentation and Sampa talked about, again, working capital and, and CapEx. How do we find the right models to finance both? Let's not try and boil the ocean one size fits all. We need to create both pieces. And, and, and therefore, to the bankers in the room, this is an opportunity, again, uh, to look at both uh, opportunities very differently uh, and, and then approach them in that context. What I want to do is talk about uh, how we were able to look at microfinance and build that scale uh, was through enabling policy, through enabling an ecosystem, and how do we bring those learnings into the impact space? What will be able to move that needle uh, in the FSPP segment? How do we bring corporates in? And one of the products that struck me when we were looking and when I was talking at the UN General Assembly two years ago was the impact, uh, was the outcome bond, uh, outcome funding, pay for success, uh, SIBs and DIPs. Now, for me, the, the philosophical disconnect there is everyone there's talking about $100 million. The moment you talk $100 million, you're esoteric, you're trying to bring in all the big wigs and have this two year, three year process to put it together. We challenged that whole hypothesis like we did 30 years ago with microfinance. Many zeros removed, can we create a small micro loan? Today we're saying, let's remove many zeros, can we create a micro bond? So I would rather do 100 FSTP bonds of $1 million each than do one FSTP bond of $100 million. Because I do know that the ability to create quick wins, to build track record, to build investor appetite, to show proof of concept, to show uh, investor interest uh, will be much more pronounced and catalytic if we can do many of these successes. And so we did that and we committed that we will do micro bonds and literally in the last 18 months, while others have taken three years to do a single bond, we've taken three months. So within three months in December, 2018, we did the world's first SDG five bond on women's empowerment. Within three months from that, we did an impact bond uh, on goal eight for skilling and jobs and livelihoods. Within three months from that, we did a five and eight combination for women empowerment. Within three months from that, we did on goal seven for clean energy. Within three months from that, we did on goal two for food security. Within three months from that, last month, we did one on a COVID impact bond. So the ability to do five crores, two crores, small ticket micro bonds, where upfront we say these are the deliverables, these are the outcomes. So Namita and Banka, you will reduce, uh, you know, X amount of sludge. This is how we are going to treat. This is the metrics uh, that are going to come out of that. Very clearly, uh, you know, looking at what those impact metrics are, and then uh, provide the money upfront based on Apurva's guarantee or based on, uh, you know, something Sakshi would do, and then go back and say, uh, you know, who is interested. Who are the stakeholders who are motivated by those outcomes? Who is interested when we have improved the treatment of fecal waste from X to Y? Who is interested when we get those which are FSTPs at 50% capacity up and running to 60%, 75%, 100%? Because those are sitting capacities that are ready. How do we make quantum improvements by doing incremental effort? And that I think is what a blended finance instrument like our micro bonds will help unlock. So I think the time has come when Apurva and Sakshi and Amita sit across the table and say, what's the right product that would at least demonstrate one pilot and then sit with Sampath and do a second one and say, these are the two now that are ready. Now let's go 
to the Unilevers or go to the Coca-Cola or go to the Benkinsers and say, are you interested from a CSR perspective to support this and provide an in incentive which effectively reduces the cost of interest? Or go to a global foundation or someone who's interested in these outcomes and say, can you pay an incentive? Or go to the government and say, this is part of your national programs, uh, would you pay the outcome funder? But unless we have these, and unless we have ta tangibly something, and I've said this before at WASH conferences, uh, there is a lot of talk, a lot of discussion, everyone's well-intentioned, but we need to bring small projects to the table, do some quick wins, take it back then to the corporate sector, take it back to the government and say, this is what we've done. Uh, the need everyone is in agreement with, the approach as Sampal said, there are quite a few well-tested approaches. Now let's do one or two financial structures but our SDG six bond for wash, uh, you know, Grameen Impact can you know be that financer if there are the right guarantee providers and the right catalyzers like Apurva and others, and let's do it because nothing succeeds like getting it done. So I'll stop here, but uh, would love to have for the conversation. Uh, thanks so much, Royston. Um, you should definitely set uh, the you know stirred the pot very quickly. Um, by giving an alternative approach to and um, through a micro bond, uh, be able to build it. I think it's also important. Let's take a quick look at the the mechanisms that are available currently, and can what role can uh, sit be and uh, at the um, uh, Dr. Achare and uh, uh, Mr. Gina one by one if the SLBC and uh, at the sit we can play in uh, activating better lending to it. Uh, take some of the risk away. I know that m uh, much of the MSME does not totally avail the uh, mudra as well as the CGT and SE uh, funding mechanisms and support mechanisms. Perhaps let's begin, uh, bring it uh, straight to uh, Dr. Acharya for your thoughts and uh, or then after that to, uh, uh, to Gina Saab for his thoughts of how uh, the SLBC can play a key role in this journey. Over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, very good afternoon. I hope I am visible and audible. Yes, you are very well, sir. Okay, Dr. thank Charlie, you. Thank go you. ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, more than me speaking, I have been listening very keenly to the observations of the fellow panelists, and it is and I can admit that it is a great learning uh, time well spent with all of you so far. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I can't agree more with uh, Mr. Briganja, who is just speaking uh, before me. Uh, but I'll uh, surely respond to some of the questions uh, that has been raised uh, uh, because all of you have spoken about the blended finance and all. Uh, uh, I'll uh, uh, so certainly, you know, uh, touch upon some of the uh, points that was uh, talked about. Uh, like say, for example, before uh, coming to the uh, bonds, etc., was uh, as Mr. Briganja was saying. Uh, see, uh, Sidbi uh, was the pioneer uh, in bringing the uh, concept of microfinance institution in this country. Earlier, we had only the SSG bank linkage, but uh, Sidbi brought in the concept of the microfinance institutions on the basis of uh, uh, Grameen Bangladesh model. And uh, what we saw is, yes, definitely debt has been a driver. Uh, but before that, uh, I think a lot of handholding and a lot of uh, capacity building initiatives have gone into it. It's not that, you know, the uh, industry has uh, uh, assumed the shape of uh, or size of uh, what it is today. Uh, just by a way of debt, uh, because I can vouch uh, since last, uh, you know, more than two decades, we have been doing a lot of capacity building effort, uh, uh, sectoral building efforts, uh, so that uh, the capacity of the microfinance institutions are built. In fact, many of you might be also knowing that uh, there was a microfinance equity fund that government of India had floated. So uh, initially, you know, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, because uh, it is the fear of unknown kind of thing to the banks, because uh, banks uh, typically being the asset funders, they have to see it to believe it. So we have to actually put it before them. When you say that, uh, you know, um, uh, two, three pilot projects, you have to actually do and, uh, you know, show it to the banks or to the uh, other funders. There, Mr. Briganja has actually hit the nail on its head. So that, you know, instead of, uh, you know, talking about the scaling up initiatives, you have to see that, you know, small, small because these are, uh, you know, societal initiatives and you cannot really have a very large scale uh, kind of uh, uh, initiative from the beginning. It has to be small, small initiatives with the societal involvement. So, uh, you know, certain points that uh, uh, Mr. Sampath raised, that is about the bid uh, security. 
uh, see uh, when uh, you are registered as an msme uh, i think let me tell uh, there is uh, clear guidelines of the government that no no bid amount is required to be submitted if you are registered as an msme so if you have this uh, udyam registration please do not submit any bid money so that takes care of your funding requirement you are saying that you know to get uh, three four projects you have to participate in 10 15 odd bids so you have to put in bid money in 10 15 projects so that is taken care of absolutely zero amount is required please do register yourself as an msme take the online uh, get get yourself uh, registered or recognized as an msme and here you are then uh, your uh, you know performance guarantee and uh, this uh, three month working capital requirement see working capital requirements are basically primarily three months only because it is assumed that the working capital cycle will be 90 days and uh, you know uh, it will rotate four times in a year so uh, it is al always uh, generally for three months and it rotates four times uh, so uh, you know uh, that is uh, when you say working capital requirement for three months i think you are referring to the cash credit and when you are taking to uh, talking about performance guarantee you are talking about a, a actually non fund based limit so uh, a, the, the, the total facility is uh, is actually a working capital kind of a facility a part of it being non fund based and one part of it being fund based and uh, yes if it is uh, you know if we have certain demonstrable model and if we can actually demonstrate the profitability of the enterprise and we are registered as an msme there is absolutely no issue in uh, getting the funding done obviously you know uh, the second model that madam was uh, proposing and the 100% uh, uh, from Uh, own sources private uh, uh, fstp that uh, she was uh, calling it i don't think you know time has come for that it has to be public fstp because uh, you know at the uh, at the beginning itself going for 100% you know private funding or debt funding for that matter is uh, possibly not going to be workable from a profitability point of point of view the payback may not be a very satisfactory from a banker's point of view so definitely the first uh, this ham model and the other model that you are suggesting are uh, very good and uh, if if uh, that is there if uh, the some kind of equity support is there some kind of participation from the government is there and most importantly if the involvement in writing from the urban local bodies are there then only this this will in uh, enthuse the confidence of the banks and the funding should not be an as cgtmsc uh, you know uh, definitely is there even in uh, mudra also it is there these are all uh, up to 10 lakh rupees mudra and beyond that also it uh, up to 2 crore cgtmsc this uh, funding is available but is yes these are the prerequisites as i said that you know we have to establish the profitability possibly you know uh, we have before that we have to establish one or two pilot projects and uh, uh, so that you know there is a demonstration effect of profitability in the minds of the banks and as i said you know bankers are uh, you know asset funders they have to see it to believe it once they see that yes it is running and running successfully then uh, definitely you know it is not a, uh, not an issue the, the funding should not be an issue so uh, as far as sidbi is concerned we are running this uh, guarantee programs on behalf of the government so there is no need of partial credit guarantee we are already giving them full guarantee under uh, credit guarantee mechanism uh, both uh, under mudra and under uh, cgtmsc but definitely it will be very helpful if you know uh, us said and other agencies give some amount of you know initial guarantees to the pilot projects once the demonstration kind of projects are established once the uh, you know the, the the community involvement is there and the uh, uh, arrangement with the urban local bodies are there i don't think there should be finance should be a problem so both fund based and non fund based funding can be done based on the credit guarantee mechanism that is available with the uh, with with, with sidbi so uh, these are my initial thoughts i think going forward we have two three other uh, speakers from financial institutions we'll also listen to them thank you manoj thank you uh, sir dr sari a uh, question could the sidbi help us to, you know the big challenge in this is the in principle it's available the challenge is that in in practice is very hard to uh, you know for it to happen and it's there's a lot of ifs and buts which come in the play is there mechanism like sidbi could help us through having a single window uh, support mechanism something like that where we could send in the applications know who to reach out to and be able to process the paperwork and the evaluation more ex you know quickly and in a more effort uh, sim seamless effort way no uh, if i have understood you correctly you are talking about some single window mechanism for uh, this kind of project for this for fstp kind of a project yes sir because other like we've talked about there are 400 to 600 uh, you know fstps are to be made every year the demand is going to come very quickly in the next few years 
each person trying to figure out each enterprise uh, trying to figure out increases the cost of their you know their operation so how can we should we help in bringing this into a more efficient way of evaluating and providing the support that we can have see at 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 this point you know uh, mm-hmm. as i said uh, we have to first establish uh, some two three success stories see mm-hmm. unless we establish two three success stories actually you know this uh, as a as a um, good recipe for debt funding is not uh, you know going to be easily sold to the banks because it be uh, as you as you know sidbi is the apex institution and we have to operate through the banking system whether through our credit guarantee mechanism or so through other systems but when you know this kind of special demands come uh, you know whether it is the microfinance movement in the country or whether you know launching a special product for the msmes during the time of covid etc sidbi is in the forefront so so far uh, this kind of uh, thing has not been demonstrated possibly to either the government or sidbi possibly going forward definitely once uh, we see that you know there is an opportunity and we have this network of microfinance institutions even through them also we can also Uh, you know think up certain products i think in uh, uh, more than commercial banks the small finance banks they will be actually because their community involvement is much more so the small finance bank uh, banks will be actually much more uh, keen and uh, they are also now onboarded uh, in the uh, credit guarantee platform so if uh, they can be uh, you know convinced about this through uh, setting up of demonstration models and putting uh, one or two good project reports and uh, taking them at, uh, to the field visits and then uh you know um, uh, possibly uh, selling the, um, the 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 fstp as a as a as a product as a, as a good to finance product uh, i i don't think there should be uh, much of a problem but at this stage it is very very initial stage we uh, all of us are also uh, are not very sure how uh, you know uh, three four years down the line the payback is going to happen not going to happen so i think one or two uh, quick success stories are uh, required to be placed before the banking system to actually you know uh, bring up their interest level thank you dr acharya certainly we'll be happy to share uh, success stories and build as they're coming through in different states uh, uh, two of them we are there they're building investing and we certainly would like to uh, lean back on you to provide us more support uh, gina saab uh, are you there with us and want to get your thoughts uh, on two areas one the role that slbcs in different states can play and does the annual credit plan uh, being put in as part of the acp we will play an, an important role in, in boosting the fstp uh, plans which the government set up state governments put up over to you sir okay good afternoon uh, mr gulati and other <coughs> dignitaries of this webinar uh, yes it, as you sir you know this uh, uh financing to fssm is uh, under social infrastructure sector which is under private sector so every slbc has annual credit plan for all banks and uh, say for odisha i am referring to slbc odisha uh, for this 2020 2021 we have a uh, annual credit plan under social infrastructure is around 350 crores and uh, still up to june the estimate was very low around 40 crores so there is a uh, the good opportunity for financing under fssm by banks and as uh, dr acharya has told for banks there is no problem as uh, say sir up to 5 crore uh, uh, will be considered under private sector and uh, uh, again cgdma cb coverage up to 2 crore is there uh, and after that only banks will ask for full lateral so uh, actually this uh, funding to fssm is uh, very nascent and uh, banks are mainly banks are not knowing about this so when suppose in slbc uh, we put this we can put this point agent item and discuss and government uh, can come forward with their views and after that uh, banks will be able to finance more and more and uh, again uh, for this uh, as uh, of beyond two crore collaterals are required so something uh, the <coughs> borrowers have to provide and uh, as you told sir uh, role of slbc is yes, uh, suppose for odisha uh, next time we can go for discussion on this and after that we can come out a plan and uh, 
uh, again, sir, uh, financing under this because this is a new and so risk may be high. So banks initially will be reluctant. But when uh, say there is some private agreement between government and this private uh, sector uh, borrowers and uh, bank, and uh, suppose state government initially provides some guarantee, and also some say state government will say uh, they give some three months that debt service reserve. An account is there if you can put some money. So banks uh, will be very happy to finance under this tool because uh, it is under private sector and uh, under social infrastructure and uh, again NSM. So uh, banks uh, first it has to be uh, well acquainted by all the banks and uh, all the banks have to after it is approved in the SLVC, so all the banks can go to their head office for uh, uh, preparing uh, policy guidelines and so banks can finance activity with that. It is my opinion. Uh, thank you, uh, Gina Sab, for your confidence and for your uh, showing us that we should be uh, building small wins in different states and using that to get more confidence of the bankers. Uh, I want to actually, you know, given the essence of time, I, I think it's important that let's take a, before we get down to hearing our financial institutions there, let's get to understand what are the different uh, ecosystem partners that we have today. How do they see the role of playing in? So I, I know that uh, we've got uh, a number of uh, financial inst uh, ecosystem partners with us today. There's Miraji has uh, joined in, there is Professor Chari, and my colleague uh, Natasha who joined from the ISC. Uh, perhaps you can tell us the, the role that, uh, in any order, if, if you like to speak, uh, the role that the ecosystem partners can play are, and are playing in building this, uh, the FSTP uh, area. And what are the, some of the challenges that you are trying to resolve in the process that, and you see that will need to be resolved by either through government intervention or through uh, better policy changes. So. Uh, maybe uh, over to Miraji and then take it from there for uh, the other speakers. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Manoj. And thanks for the interesting discussion. Uh, just as an ecosystem player, I want to clarify that we are also part of this larger alliance. We call it a National Fecal Sludge and Septage Management Alliance. That has about almost 30 different partners who have been engaged in these activities. And some of the issues that we are discussing today are very much part of the agenda of the Alliance. So it's, it's very, very helpful to hear some of the discussion. I wanted to raise a couple of points maybe that one is that FSSM is a local service and therefore it is very, very important to make sure that the local governments are strengthened and have the capacity to both manage these services and to deal with the private sector players who they are inviting to participate in the provision of this service, be it in terms of uh, either the FSTPs, which we are discussing today, uh, especially largely through, except I think the case of Andhra and Telangana, largely through EPC contracts with Vinit also referred to earlier. Uh, and therefore, uh, strengthening these local governments to make sure that the processes are followed properly, their finances are strengthened so that the necessary payments are made and so on, this is very crucial. I think everybody, if Namita was raising the issue of land, this is something that again, will have to come to local governments. And I'm a little bit surprised because generally, at least in the state of Maharashtra where we work, uh, the responsibility to find land is with the local government or if there is a state government agency with them and not with the private service provider. And there are enough opportunities to do that, to explore possibilities of having a combined uh, land area with, let's say, solid waste management on which there is far more work that has already happened under Swachh Bharat Mission. But second major issue that needs to be addressed uh, with local government is the question of delayed payments that I think some of you referred to. 
<clears throat> and something that we have been looking at as to how to address. Uh, this is very, very crucial issue. I think Sampadji referred to payments not coming in time or I think one of the financial institution uh, uh, speaker also referred to this. And this can actually link to delayed payments would link to uh, problems for the private sector in repaying the debt that they may have taken. So that is something that needs to be. We've come out with a paper on this. I think we've put it on chat just now. And there are many possible ideas, but one thing that has emerged as important is to introduce more transparency in the system of payments at the local level. We have much better transparency now through e-procurement in most of our states for local projects and state projects. But in actual payments to be made later on, this transparency doesn't exist. We may also want to look at the TNUDF experience where they have been issuing municipal bonds linked to and water bonds, uh, the pool finance kind of item, I mean, the kind of mechanisms that they have used to address this issue. So these are issues that will need to be addressed for making these projects more viable, even if they are EPC contracts and o and So that is one area that is, to my mind, very important. And second area, which I think today morning session, Sankalp uh, morning session, uh, the Odisha uh, PS referred to the need for very simple technologies to be used for FSTPs. And this is something to be kept in mind because if you want to uh, make these uh, make these FSTPs more viable, the o and should be as simple as possible and more easily doable. We can also then try and get the women groups, the SAG groups involved in these o and processes. And they already have the bank linkage actually established through a variety of uh, schemes that are already there uh, through SIDBI that he was referring to, uh, Dr. Acharya was referring to, but through also other mechanisms that are already there. So that's something that, and it will again help to also lower the cost of uh, promoting FSTPs. And if we want to achieve this whole S sustainable development goals that Royston was referring to, over then by 2030, then we have to have costs that are more affordable for our for us. Uh, one other thing we are, I know that we are focusing on only FSTPs, but it is also important to look at desludging uh, as a business and what can be done. Uh, more regular desludging mechanisms are very very important, and we we introduce ideas around PPP models where we got private sector to bring in their own trucks in two cities in Maharashtra and which is now being scaled up through what we refer to as a scheduled uh, desludging arrangement. So these are things that need to be also looked at. Uh, Royston also referred to the possibility of looking at blended finance. And this is one form of blended finance. It's again been recorded and documented quite well. We are also exploring the possibility of a DIB, development impact bond for FSSM through a more integrated model, which combines both FSTP and the desludging together. And how do we, and he again was referring to the importance of impact matrices. This is something that we worked on. And I think this is something that will be required. So one hand, we have to have local government strengthening and second hand, explore more innovative models of this type. And that is how maybe one way of keep, while keeping our technologies as simple as possible, because as long as we are meeting the necessary standards, and this is what we are trying to do, working with government of Maharashtra, where out of your 400 FSTPs, about 150, 100 are already operational, and another 150 are under construction and with very simple technology. So this is already happening in the state of Maharashtra. Let me stop that. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. is one point I wanted to make was that the, it is very nice to see that there is a clear understanding of vocabulary on both sides, more or less on the, the ecosystem or the technology provider and the financing. This is sometimes a major issue. 
that we face, that both sides actually are talking very different languages and something that as we go on, we'll have to also think of. Thank you, Miraji. Uh, uh, Dr. Chari, your thoughts? And Dr. Chari, Rafin, sir. Professor Chari, you're on mute. Oh, yeah. Can you hear <laughs> yes. me now? Yes, yes, yes. 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 thank you. Perfect. Very good thank to have you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Manoj. Uh, as part of the uh, Gates Foundation uh, and uh, Government of Andhra Pradesh and Government of Telangana collaboration, uh, we are actually providing technical assistance and more so the transaction advisory support to uh, the states. And if I may say so, uh, currently, uh, you know, sort of I'm directly involved in the transaction advisory for almost uh, 147 uh, fecal sludge treatment plants under a hybrid annuity model. And uh, nobody heard about hybrid annuity model in FSTP, uh, both on the government side as well as on the private side. So as an ecosystem player, we had to really, we started in 2007 and we are here, we are talking about ham in this space. Uh, I think it's a great uh, sense of, uh, you know, uh, happiness that I see. Uh, parallelly, we are, as Mr. Sampat mentioned, we have a couple of uh, experiences in handling EPC type uh, uh, projects in FSTP. He mentioned about 150 KLD, that's on the extended EPC. Uh, we also have uh, conventional civil type contracts about 70. So it's a, a very interesting experience of uh, on one extreme is a PPP, the other extreme is somewhere in between is a EPC, extended EPC. And we have a, a typical contract-led BOQ type of experiences. So we have a very interesting wide experiences. Now, let me uh, uh, sort of tease out one or two confidence building exercise or uh, you know issues I would like to speak about FSTP. When government of Telangana, uh, government of Andhra Pradesh, there was a change in leadership. As many of you know, there was a, a cancellation of many contracts. Uh, which has not exceeded 20%, they sort of address, they sort of went, cancelled almost many projects except FST. So I think this is one important recognition that governments are also realizing that FSTP is a, a very powerful environmental as well as social protection initiative, and they looked at this whole sector favorably. So that's number one. Number two, uh, you know, the, uh, I, you know, I'm actually currently doing a third party evaluation for the Namami Gange where all almost like uh, 300 plus PPP projects uh, on ham model uh, across the country on the STP side. Now, people are actually queuing up to finance these projects. I spoke to Adhanis, I spoke to practically all the sector players and there is a huge demand to finance these entities, the reason being, there is a sovereign guarantee. There is a guarantee directly from NMCG, National Mission for Clean Ganga. There is a direct sovereign guarantee. So we also looked at the road sector. So keeping that into perspective, both in the state of Telangana and Andhra, we made state paying to the private sector directly rather than going through every town uh, you know, paying the municipality, paying them uh, through on a long-term basis is going to be a little tricky. And as you know, when we started, there was hardly any player who heard about FSTP in, in the PPP model. So I think the good news is state is actually giving the complete guarantee, including the escrow mechanism, two months of advance payment. In reality, there could be differences. In reality, there could be variations, both on the private sector as well as on the uh, a government side, but state guarantee, like the way HUTCO demands state guarantee to finance a water supply project or a sewerage project. Here for FSTP, there is a very nice example of states of Andhra and Telangana giving a complete guarantee for payment for the next 10 years. So that's one, I think, a model we need to look at it. Like the way NMCG, National Mission for Clean Ganga, they look for sovereign guarantee. We can't expect government of India to give guarantee. At least the respective states should start giving guarantee to create this ecosystem. And that's what exactly what was done in 
uh, Andhra and Telangana. I know I, I'm not completely uh, agree with uh, Namita ji when she says because both of uh, both uh, Namita as well as uh, Mr. Sampa, they are key partners. In fact, they're first entrants in the hybrid annuity model in these states. I must say that the condition precedents, uh, what she mentioned, land as a condition precedent or utilities as a condition precedent is not bad. You know, if I say there are about 140, uh, you know, FSTPs, I must say that more than 110 lands have been identified. About 20, 25 lands are uh, still uh, getting resolved. We also not pushing because the private sector is also moving, not moving at the same pace. So, however, I, I would say that land is not a major, major concern because many a times the solid waste location and this FSTP locations are... Uh, so, the condition precedent related issue can be from a, our experience can be addressed. It is not a, like a STP or it is not like a solid waste management. These are small units requiring half acre to one acre of land. It's not going to be a big issue. I think as far as the delayed payment is concerned, delayed payment is there for EPC contracts. Delayed payments are there for everything. I think the way to deal with the delayed payment is to bring the state and also to create escrow mechanisms so that these delayed payment issues can be addressed. The last point, from my side, as far as uh, 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 this conversation, what we are looking at it, while we discussed about the government and the issues of condition precedent, uh, we discussed about the payment issues. I think it's equally important, if I may say so, uh, uh, Namita ji and Mr. Sampath are exceptions probably, but we have seen, we work with almost like 20 odd private sector on the PPP uh, uh, mode right now in these states and a couple of other states are also showing interest the capacity of the private sector to deliver. Private sector is not God. It's just because they're private sector, it doesn't mean everybody is at the same pace. I think there is a very strong you know, opportunity where we build capacity of the private sector to raise up to the occasion and make a compelling story to the bankers and, and make a case for it. So I think uh, this is an equally important piece. If you want to build this whole ecosystem, then capacity of the private sector to deliver results with quality at scale is a big issue. In fact, the cost, the project, each project size in FSTP space is not, is not more than two crores or at the most two and a half crores. The reason why Namita and Sampar, they're talking about 20 crores are they, is because we clustered at least 10 of them into a single package. So the package size is about 20, 25 crores. I think this is another way to attract and make uh, the transaction much more efficient is to bundle cluster these projects together rather than standalone municipal by municipal project because that will be too small for the banker and the investment and the transaction cost of this whole exercise. These are some Thank initial you, thoughts we can... Yeah. No, these were excellent uh, comments, uh, Professor Chari, with respect to uh, the way the sovereign guarantees have been able to trigger uh, the solutioning and give the confidence that uh, the to the both to the finance uh, to the entrepreneur as well as to the financial institutions that there is a backup mechanism available. So thank you so much. I know we are running out of time, but I, if uh, permitted, I'd like to extend this by another ten to fifteen minutes. And I certainly hope we I certainly want to hear a little bit of uh, what the financial institutions would like uh, to boost the uh, performance. But before we go there. Uh, over to you, Natasha, for uh, your uh, the role that ISC is playing and uh, the important changes that they are bringing about to help this uh, go through FST, the role of ISC. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Manoj. Uh, so ISC is pretty new in this sector, and we come at it from a slightly different angle uh, than say ASCII or uh, SEPT. Um, you know, as ecosystem builders. Uh, Ours is primarily a role of raising finance and raising awareness of financing for the sector. So that's something we've been doing uh, over the last 18, 20 months. And uh, I'm just going to share a couple of experiences that we've had. So, uh, you know, we actually divide this between grant and debt. So blended finance is really the way we believe uh, that, you know, finance should be raised for this sector. And that's primarily to do with the kind of funding that uh, FSTPs require. I absolutely agree with um, 
and uh, maybe Professor Chari won't agree with me that you know you require large, uh, uh, I mean, uh, FSTPs to be bundled together. I believe that if you break it up uh, into bite-sized pieces, the way um, uh, Grameen is doing, for example, I think there is a better chance, uh, you know, to get the funding uh, put in place. Uh, just a couple of things that we have encountered while talking to funders. Uh, if you look at it from the grant uh, perspective, I think one of the big things that has come up in pretty much all the conversations I have with uh, corporates or with, uh, you know, foundations is the need for a different narrative. Uh, you know, most of these corporates, most of the uh, foundations, primarily the corporates, I should say, are willing to fund in the areas in which they operate. And uh, when it is something where they can see a benefit from that perspective, then the narrative becomes far more attractive than uh, telling them to fund uh, somewhere where they really have no, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, uh, they, they have nothing there in that in that space. So I think uh, it's really important to uh, blend your narrative with the kind of investor that you are talking to. And grants are a difficult thing to come by. They're not easy. Um, if you look at debt, I think uh, both uh, uh, Niraji and Professor Chari have spoken quite uh, well and in detail about the kind of different instruments. Uh, but again, over there, if you look at bankers, and I'm a banker myself, uh, they, they understand profit. They understand what is in it, what is it that they get out of it uh, in a different way from, uh, you know, from a, a grantor. And uh, I think the narrative that we are taking to banks is, again, not something which is clear to them. So while I understand that you know there are uh, you know uh, models that could prove attractive to them, I think we need to be able to get them to understand those models better. I mean, just look at the number of people that we have who actually started as participants. There were 50 people who started. We are, we're now to, down to 35, and I wonder how many actually uh, bankers are actually there in this. I would have loved to see a lot of bankers coming to this because that's really the community that we are aiming at uh, in terms of uh, looking for financing. So that's again something that I felt every time I meet with them that you know you have to look at their narrative a lot more in detail. And um, with regards to sovereign guarantees, that was a really interesting point you put, um, Dr. Chari. But do remember that you know the Adanis of this world are at a very different level from uh, the uh, individual operators that we want to find financing for uh, you know, for the smaller, uh, for the FS, individual FSTPs. And again, I'm not entirely convinced that banks will, or even state governments will actually uh, look at, you know, look at uh, giving guarantees. Uh, I do hope that it happens, but I'm not entirely sure that that will happen when it is a, a smaller operator coming in for a guarantee. So I'm just going to leave it there because I know you're rushed for time, you know, it's just some initial thoughts. Thanks so much, uh, Natasha. And for, uh giving a, a contrarian thought on to it. Very interesting. Uh, I think it's time for the financial institutions to tell us the, what is their sense about uh, FSTPs, how they would like to see it, uh, you know, getting more integrated solution for our, us as we build it, where the financial institutions play a more active role in scale, uh, quickly scaling up the program. The number of uh, people come from different financial institutions, aggregators, MFIs, NBFCs have come in. So our first one, you know, I'll just open it up given the essence of time. I mean, uh, Nikesh, maybe you can open it up and then over to, um, you know, Sai and Meenalji to give their thoughts about what can be done. Hemant, I'm also looking forward from a banker's perspective uh, from Indescent, what are your thoughts to it? So over to you, uh, Nikesh, for your initial thoughts. Thank you. Nikesh, you're on mute. There are different ecosystem players and everybody's objectives and the goals are different. And by that, I mean, a lending institution has a fiduciary responsibility and hence the constant refrain and remark on risk. And whether there's a lack of appreciation, whether it's more of a perceived risk or it's more viable. So I think, you know, uh, one question that's been taken very casually is, I think everybody appreciates the, the purpose is very good and it should be funded, but lending institutions have to market as an NP and provide for if it crosses the 90 day mark. And so it boils down to the critical thing, whether the payments 
are actually will be met within 90 days of the due date and that's where the so the key beneficiary of this if the beneficiary pays for the services of this you know that's what shulab has done they have not waited for the government if the beneficiary chooses then this suddenly transforms itself into a consumer loan and there be a very there can be a flow for it this is what i can think about one of the things i saw in vinit's presentation that 18% rate of interest is pretty high uh, if you will look at the mbfc sector if it's uh, for this kind of a profile it will be beyond 18% so i think you know we are trying to change the financial system the financial system has its own fiduciary responsibility i think both of us need to come together and meet at a certain place and that's where the inter interventionist bodies say a water.org or a unicef or a water aid can come so is anybody to ready to come in for with interest rate sub subvention that's one possibility partial guarantees is another good one that i heard so that's how this ecosystem will work i don't think so we can, the lending institutions can change the other side and i don't think so the other side can change here we need one middle layer intervening and mitigating the risk here because all said and done the lenders have a fiduciary responsibility they are handling people's money so uh, this is what i think about it uh, thanks nikesh uh, absolutely uh, if it it does align with uh, bankers and all fi's having fiduciary responsibility at the end of the day that's what it is uh, i'm hoping that you know as we go through this we are able to think of the alternative middle layer solutioning what our dog is that definitely uh, supports that thought process of how do we bring in that a more effective middle layer which is only for an intermittent period of time that's and right. not for a long that is the only way to do it that's the key factor to keep in mind so i over to you i see you already with it yeah uh, thanks manoj and uh, uh, in fact i concur with what nikesh had also mentioned so adding to a couple of things taking from sampath's initial point of view also about lack of collateral and that is where at caspian we uh, specialize in terms of providing debt capital without the need for a collateral security so because that part is taken off our primarily underwriting of the risk is on uh, you know the underlying cash flows and as long as there is certainty to that and that also has been discussed so Uh, just wanted to reinforce that point that even uh, at Caspian, uh, that's a view uh, we take into consideration. But there are two things which I want to add, probably which has not been touched upon uh, during the entire discussion. One is about the long gestation period of the project. So, like, yeah, uh, EPC might uh, be the uh, way in which projects are being dealt right now, but we know that probably a ham where uh, the projects just stretch for a period of. Uh, six to eight years uh, may be the norm going forward, right? So uh, there is really less scope for financial institution to actually start uh, lending for such long periods. So is there uh, any body which helps in refinancing these things, or you know, uh, other lending institutions coming into refinance is one aspect which uh, must be deliberated upon, and the other aspect is about. uh i'm sure with the kind of potential which is there it is not totally be driven by debt right there is only so much like uh, you know uh, founders like uh, namita and sampath can put in so uh, and uh, the surplus generated from each project will not help them take in more debt so uh, uh, is there uh, they should also probably be a more ecosystem to uh, help some equity inflows coming be it uh, venture equity private equity is of course very far off or you know maybe in terms of grant from the government etc so uh, these were uh, in the interest of time two aspects about uh, the long gestation period and uh, uh, what is equity uh, coming into the sector is what i wanted to focus on thanks so much uh, sai um, i think we're out of time uh, meenal and uh, himant uh, if your thoughts uh, could if you could give a few minutes and uh, cover it i'd like to be uh, you know just uh, what are your thoughts on this yeah hi i think uh, since we are running out of time i'll just make it really quick uh, 
I completely agree with what Sai and Nikesh have uh, have already said about the financial institutions uh, perspective. So visibility of cash flows and the quality of the receivables is definitely something that as an institution we would look at. Tenor of course becomes very, very important for, uh, for especially for NBFCs, <clears throat> excuse me. But just one point I would like to uh, like to add in addition to what has been said is the capacity building support, uh, you know, which like Polodot or this providing, uh, say in the sanitation space, if, if there is some kind of support which is there as a capacity building support, not only to train our staff, but to train our partners as well, our customers as well, as to what are the kind of risks, what are the mitigants, what are the technology is used, what are the products that can be developed in this sector. And then initially starting with a pilot project, uh, uh, you know, either with Sampaji, I'm ready to do that as an institution, we can take it up as a pilot project. And once we've developed that, then, then talk about a larger scale. So that's all in short that I wanted to say. Uh, no, great points on capacity building um, and the need for that. So thanks so much, Meenal, and I appreciate your point. Um, Hemant, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, so Manoj, sorry, Hemant could not join. I am Raj from Indescent. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Raj. So uh, just, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Sai and uh, Meenal has, yeah, uh, I think Sai and Meenal has, you know, highlighted the, uh, you know, views of Financial Institute. But as a banker, you know, many of uh, these players become unorganized comes from the unorganized sector, especially in the conveyance, as well as, you know, in the uh, uh, treatment sector. And, you know, most of them lies at the, you know, intersection of the civil plus, you know, FSSM players. So that is one of the challenge as a bank of cases, but, you know, the credit guarantee, which comes with the USAID or, you know, the interest subvention kind of tool, which, you know, uh, probably comes from some foundation can help us uh, to scale this funding. And, you know, as Dr. Chari said, you know, the smaller transaction size can be, you know, dealt with by giving some, you know, cluster of projects, probably okay. that would happen as we, you know, go forward. And as you mentioned, there are already 400 to 500 projects under, you know, uh, so probably that yeah. would help us uh, to scale the funding from bankers. Yeah. Thanks, Raj. Uh, so great, uh, you know, Thanks everyone for your inputs. This has been very helpful. On one side, we learned quite a bit in terms of uh, what are the uh, changes that are happening. Uh, Dr. Charya and others have talked about more evidence and 300 to 400 FSTP certainly is a strong place of evidences. On this other side, uh, and there's, there's some realistic challenges that we all have talked about today. Again, they've come up. I think solving those is critical. On the other side, uh, the financial institutions have also expressed that there is there is an opportunity. I mean, the way we, we can look at partial guarantees, we can look at blended financing outcome funding, we can solve this problem. There is a work to be done on both sides at this stage. I hope this was a useful and uh, valuable session for you to you know start thinking about it. Certainly, we need to collaborate more in the FSTP spectrum and look forward to working with all of you again. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.